Hello, everybody. My name is Bob Wildfang, and I'm the horticultural interpreter at the Ken Sealing Waterloo Region Museum in Kitchener, Ontario. For the next little while, I'd like to talk to you about heritage flower gardens. Uh, we have a living history village in Kitchener called Dune Heritage Village. It's a 60 acre uh, site that shows visitors what life was like in Waterloo Region in the year 1914. So the uh, buildings in the village are restored to the way they would look in 1914. And the uh, people who work there and volunteer there are dressed in period costume and do the kinds of activities that people would do in the year 1914 so that we can uh, teach our visitors, school children, and, uh, and uh, visiting tourists from other countries what life was like and how we lived and how we came to be the way that we are. My job at the uh, museum is to look after the flower gardens. We have uh, a number of buildings, uh, houses, trade buildings, uh, a church, and um, uh, around all of the uh, houses and the farms in particular, we have uh, gardens that represent the agricultural, horticultural, and, um, and, and medicinal traditions of, uh, uh, of Ontario about 100 years ago. So looking after these gardens and uh, giving tours and giving uh, workshops on, on how to grow the kinds of plants that we grow and how to use them. That occupies quite a bit of my time. Uh, all the work at the gardens is done in the period way. We use the same kinds of tools and we use the same kinds of materials. It, uh, it really is living history. I also work for an organization called Seeds of Diversity, which is a seed saving organization. Uh, Seeds of Diversity is a uh, a group of uh, about a thousand people who save seeds of uh, unusual heritage garden uh, vegetables, flowers, uh, fruit, grains, herbs, uh, garden plants that are um, difficult to find. And um, if we didn't have people growing them and saving their seeds, then those varieties would no longer exist. Uh, about two thirds of the varieties of uh, flowers and vegetables that uh, Seeds of Diversity's members grow and save seeds uh, are not available from seed catalogs. You can look in all the seed catalogs and you just can't find two thirds of the varieties that we grow. So if we weren't growing them and saving their seeds so that we can keep growing them, those varieties wouldn't exist. And um, many of the flowers that uh, we grow uh, at our museum are in that category. So we do have to save our own seeds. Now, I uh, will only talk about the flowers. I'd love to talk about vegetables and herbs in another talk, perhaps, but today we're only talking about the heritage flowers. Uh, we'll talk about perennials, we'll talk about the annuals, and uh, especially we'll talk about what makes them have an old fashioned look. Now, um, most people, when they, uh, when they think about old fashioned flowers, they think about old perennials. You, you see some here, the bleeding hearts in the top, roses at the top right. We have uh, foxglove and gladiolus. Um, our annuals, especially the old fashioned annuals are, are uh, very interesting because um, they were some of the very first tropical plants that were introduced into Canada were actually annuals. So we're going to talk about tropical plants and we're going to talk about um, the, uh, the, the perennial plants that are mainly from places like Europe and Asia. We're going to talk a little bit about how um, plants were used by farmers originally and then later on by um, home gardeners. And the reason is that uh, if you go back about 100 years, probably more than half of the residents of Canada lived in the country. Today, it's, it's the other way around. Most people live in the cities and, and relatively few people live in the country. But 100 years ago, more than half of us lived in the country. We either lived on farms or we worked on farms. We knew our plants. People grew up uh, working with plants. And so um, uh, most people were at least familiar with the, uh, the flowers and vegetables that were around them. Uh, and almost everybody could recognize um, hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of flowers. It was just a, a culture where people knew their flowers and their plants. Not to make it seem as if everyone lived in the country though, and uh, not to make it seem that 
we were still pioneers. By uh, 1900, we had cities in Canada. We had um, hydroelectric power. We had trains. There were all sorts of modern conveniences. It's just that fewer than half of the people lived in the cities and had access to those conveniences. There were very wealthy people. Um, just as today, there, there were people who could afford just anything. And, uh, and that meant that um, any kind of hort horticultural product, any kind of plant that you can imagine could have been available because there was someone who could afford it. The, the vast majority of people had a, a more limited means. Um, generally, people had a little less wealth than the average person uh, today in terms of buying power. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to, to really put your finger on how much money people had because um, things cost a little more as a proportion of income, but uh, there wasn't as much to buy either. People didn't have as many choices of things to spend their money on. So when we look at how comfortable people were, we find that people were generally fairly comfortable, fairly happy, but they didn't have as many things and they didn't have as much money. And instead, they, uh, they made use of what they had and um, uh, you would find that they had uh, actually, if anything, a little bit more time than uh, people do today because there were fewer things to do. So naturally, if you're at home and you don't have uh, a, a lot of other things to do like watch TV and you don't have a lot of places to go because you don't have a car, then what would you do with your spare time? Well, you'd garden. And for sure, um, people worked very hard in their gardens without the modern conveniences, without, uh, you know, rototillers and, and uh, uh, power tools. All the work was done by hand. So uh, this young gentleman has a, a long row to hoe and a lot of work to do. But at the same time, this was a period of time when people had more leisure. There were, um, there, were, there were more what we would think of as conveniences. People could get uh, delivery of things that they would otherwise go without. People were starting to get uh, a, a little bit of, uh, of help from electricity that would make their lives a bit easier and give them a little bit more free time. More people were uh, able to afford to buy some of their food instead of having to grow all their food. And that meant they found that they had a little bit of spare time, a little bit of leisure, a little time for flowers. And here's an example of a garden which doesn't have any food plants in it. It isn't a vegetable garden, it's just a flower garden. That was a little bit of a status symbol when you think that more than half of people worked and lived on farms, more than half of the people were growing the food that they and their families survived on, well, to have a garden only for flowers was a little bit of a status symbol. It showed that you, you had kind of made it and you didn't have to grow your own food. You could buy your own food and you didn't have to spend all your time making the, the food and the, the clothes that you, you uh, needed to survive. You could spend your time just growing flowers. So people wanted a, a place to go with this newfound leisure time. And this is the sort of thing we start to see around 1900 public parks. We're starting to show up in cities all across Canada. Um, people modeled these parks after larger parks. Okay, in a, a, a small municipality, they might set up a park and they would model it after one that they saw in a bigger city. And the bigger cities would be modeling their parks after the, those that they saw in even bigger cities. So think of Central Park in New York City. Think of Boston Common in Boston, these, these great famous parks that were designed by famous landscape architects. They were actually modeled from uh, parks in, in Europe. Think of Versailles as the model for some of the great big municipal parks in North America and think of those as the models for uh, parks in larger Canadian cities and think of those as the models for the parks in towns and villages. Those were the models for people's home gardens too. So what we see is that the same kinds of design elements and, and look at this picture, see the, um, the, the sort of walking paths, and nice 
big space, open space for people to play and sit, but also the island beds, these round flower beds. They're called island beds because they're sort of like islands in the middle of the grass. Usually they have a, a tall plant in the middle and sort of medium height plants around that, lower plants around the outside. This is the sort of, uh, of planting uh, design that we didn't see before this period. But we do see it in this period and we see it in parks and we see it in public uh, spaces. We see it in home gardens. People were copying this kind of new look. Horticulture societies also got in on this, um, especially in a smaller uh, municipality. If, uh, if, if, the municip if the municipality set aside some space for a public park, they might not have enough money to pay someone to look after the park. So the local garden club or the local horticulture society might take that on. <clears throat> horticulture societies had a lot of influence. They were often organized by the leaders of the municipality. The mayor might be a, a principal person in the horticulture society. And the reason for that was that they were trying to better their town. A lot of um, communities kind of looked like this. They were, um, now, we didn't have paved roads, they didn't have sidewalks. Uh, as I said, people didn't have a lot of disposable uh, cash. And so um, they weren't necessarily able to keep up the kinds of property standards that uh, uh, we might expect today and, and that uh, more wealthy communities could probably afford. So horticulture societies were founded in many communities uh, uh, to, to uh, create an incentive for uh, beautifying um, for, for raising property standards, planting some flowers and cleaning things up, making things look nicer. And uh, you know how garden clubs and horticulture societies often have contests for the best flower, for the, the nicest arrangement of peonies or something like that. That is the reason they started out with those prizes to try to encourage people to grow more flowers because that would beautify the community. That would make the community look nicer and the principal uh, uh, politicians and industrialists in the town would, um, uh, would get right behind that because they wanted more people to settle in that town and, uh, and create a workforce and create a tax base and, and build the community. Horticulture was not just something sort of nice. It was actually viewed as the way to build a community. Horticulture societies also got into uh, schools, encouraging students to learn how to grow plants, how to grow uh, vegetables, how to grow flowers. Um, you can see in the bottom picture, the school, the old schoolhouse. See the little tower on the top of the schoolhouse where the bell would be, that, that bell rings and tells the kids to come in. Well, they didn't just spend all their day inside the school. They worked in the garden outside and look at how big that garden is, that whole space in the foreground of the bottom picture, that's the school garden where the kids planted and tended flowers and vegetables, which maybe they sold to raise money for the school, but also in the pro process to learn and, uh, and to learn the value of hard work and perseverance and sometimes disappointment. These were all values that were to be taught and it was, um, it was all through horticulture and flowers. Here are a few things you just don't see any more. These are two train stations. On the left, that's the uh, train station in uh, Broadview, Saskatchewan. And on the right, that's the train station in Hamilton, Ontario. They had uh, often large, elaborate gardens, um, partly to make the, the uh, train station look nicer. The horticulture societies got behind that because they wanted the community to be attractive to people at first glance. And where did people get their first glance of a community? Their first impression was at the train station because that's how the majority of people arrived in a town. So sometimes the Hort Society um, organized the garden and, and helped to uh, provide the plants. And sometimes the rail lines did that. It became a point of pride uh, in this period for the, uh, for the train um, companies like the CPR and the CNR, the Grand Trunk Railway, different um, uh, rail companies to uh, even compete with each other a little bit 
to have the, uh, the best gardens at their train stations. It created a nice place for people to spend some time while they're waiting. And uh, it also created uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, of civic pride, because as I said, the train station was, if not the center of town, it was often on the outskirts of town, but it was the first and last place that most people saw. So it was the, the impression of the town right there at the train station. Here's an island bed right at the train station, a really practical and, and sensible way to, uh, to organize your flowers, the top tall flowers in the middle, medium sized flowers around those, and then the short ones uh, uh, around the outside. These happen to be dahlias, uh, nicotiana, and alyssum. And this is uh, an old fashioned perennial called valerian. Uh, uh, Valerian, by the way, uh, has a really nice uh, uh, folk name. It's also called Kissed Me Over the Garden Gate. And uh, I think it's called that because it has a wonderful, delicious fragrance. It smells like vanilla to me. It's, uh, it, it's really tall, about three or four feet tall. And uh, over the garden gate, it has this kiss of fragrance that's just like vanilla. It's a lovely plant to grow, very hardy. Um, you plant it once and it just keeps on coming back year after year after year. And that's, that's really what most plants did before the year 1900 or so. Um, most plants that we had in Canada were perennials. And the reason that perennials and annuals are different from each other, perennials are plants that grow back every year. Annuals are plants that you have to plant one year after another because they, they don't survive the winter. The only difference between annuals and perennials is that they are uh, from different parts of the world where in case of perennials, it's colder. And in the case of annuals, it's hotter. Annuals are tropical plants that don't survive the winter here, but they're perennial. That means they live every year after year after year in tropical places where they, they don't get cold in the winter. So technically annuals and perennials are both perennial, but only some of them are perennial here and the, uh, the le less hardy ones are annuals. So how this makes a difference is that in a perennial border, and this is the old fashioned kind of look that you would see in the 1800s, just a perennial garden. Um, it's a little difficult to rearrange perennials. You can do it. You can dig up perennials and move them back and forth and make different patterns and arrangements, but uh, it's a lot of work. Whereas with annuals, it's quite a bit easier to move them around and, and change them because you plant them again every year. This uh, pattern of annuals and a great big tropical uh, castor bean in the middle, this is only possible when you can, uh, can replant the, the garden bed every year with annuals. So using these new tropical plants that were in fact new in the uh, late 1800s in Canada, um, it created a whole new way of gardening. We can change the color scheme, we can change the pattern, we can, we can uh, change where we have the, the tall parts and the short parts in the garden, uh, compared to only being able to plant perennials and sort of leave them there uh, year after year. An annual garden is awfully interesting because it, you, you can make it look completely different every year. That, that access to tropical plants, which came uh, in the late 1800s, that completely revolutionized the way that we grow. You could do things like this. These are portulaca. Red portulaca in the middle and white portulaca around it, making a, a heart shape. Um, then this is this is actually um, the patterned off of, off of an actual uh, garden. Uh, someone who did this uh, around the year 1910. Um, you can tell which uh, peren or sorry which uh, portulaca are going to be red and which are going to be white by the color of the stem. Incidentally, if you look at uh, the seedlings even before they bloom. The uh, white flowered portulaca have a light colored stem and the darker flowered portulaca have uh, a, a red or, or even orange stem. That way you can separate them and plant them in this way. But back then you could buy your portulaca seeds by color. You could buy a pack of white and a pack of yellow and a pack of uh, red and a pack of pink and uh, grow them separately and plant them into a pattern. 
Now, this is to give you an idea of uh, what we mean when we talk about Victorian gardens and Edwardian gardens. Okay, the Victorian style is uh, more of a sort of formal, uh, rigid style, often geometrical, um, whereas the Edwardian garden uh, style is a little bit more natural. Uh, it, it it goes in uh, in in waves. It goes in in um, uh, irregular shapes, uh, and it's intended to look more like the way plants grow in nature. Um, what you might find if you look this up and you, you read uh, about the Victorian garden style versus the Edwardian garden style, you might find uh, a big difference depending on where the book is printed. Um, the Victorian garden uh, was a, a common uh, style in England throughout the reign of Queen Victoria. Uh, she reigned from uh, 1837 to 1901. That's pretty much all of the 1800s, really. She was the queen for a long time. And uh, that's why that period of time is known as the Victorian era. And it's kind of known for being uh, rigid in terms of social hierarchy and rigid in terms of, of, of personal expectations. That uh, rigidity kind of faded away a little bit into the 20th century and when we became a little bit more laid back. And so we think of the Edwardian period as a time of, of being a little bit more refreshed and, and uh, uh, less rigid. Uh, and that's why we refer to those two garden styles as Victorian gardens and Edwardian gardens. But funnily enough, in Canada, it took us about 30 to 50 years to catch on to the styles in England. So our Victorian garden uh, styles came 50 years after they did in England. And our Edwardian garden styles came um, after King Edward had actually died. His son, George, was already on the throne by the time um, we were getting interested in Edwardian style gardens. So um, in fact, our gardens looked quite old fashioned by comparison to England. We were that much behind the times. What were we growing in this period around 1900 to 1920? Lots and lots of asters is one answer to that question. Uh, asters were far and away the most popular garden plant. This is a powder puff aster. It's just one of many different kinds of asters you could buy from one seed catalog that we know of, 103 different named varieties of asters. That's just from one seed catalog. Uh, other other uh, seed companies carried other varieties. Um, this is a mixture of pink and sort of uh, blue purple um, asters. You could easily get powder puff asters just in pink, powder puff asters just in purple, powder puff asters just in white. And you could also get Krigo asters in various colors as a mix or in separate colors. You could get other kinds. These are called China asters, um, 103 different kinds. That had to be a very, very popular species to be able to support that many different kinds. And for sure, you do find asters being grown in gardens throughout North America during this period. Um, they're not a, an easy garden plant. And so that's interesting to know that uh, people put a lot of effort into their gardening. If they were growing asters, they're not hard to grow, but they're, they're for sure not the easiest plant either. Uh, People put a lot of effort into their gardens, but as we know, a lot of them grew up on farms, so they knew their plants and they knew how to grow them. I'll take you on a little detour into the vegetable section here. These are some old uh, seed packets. Not every company had their own uh, seed packets. They would often contract the uh, printing of the packets out to uh, another company who might give the same um, envelopes to different seed or different seed companies and they might have to print their own name down at the bottom or something like that but we have uh, vegetable seed packets here kohlrabi leeks lettuce lots of melons i don't know all of these as musk melons but for sure they had a greater assortment of musk melons than we do today oh we got mustard and nasturtiums and okra oh wait a minute why are nasturtiums among the vegetables? And this is what we find in seed catalogs of the period. Nasturtiums were half the time, at least, they were in the vegetable section instead of the flower section because nasturtiums are completely edible. 
You can eat the flowers, you can eat the leaves, you can even eat the little seed pods. Those are in the top left, the little light green group of three things. Those are seed pods. You can uh, pickle those. They're uh, a spicy kind of flavor, all parts of the plant. And so they were thought of sometimes as a flower, but oftentimes as, uh, as a salad green. Also, they were very, very popular, almost as popular as asters. We have dwarf kinds, we have climbing kinds, like you see on the right. They come in different colors. There are uh, seed catalogs of this period that have um, up to 26 different named varieties of nasturtiums in colors such as yellow, orange, and red, but also salmon, salmon pink, salmon brown, yellow pink, yellow orange, brown, um, just a, a, an incredible array of colors of this plant that we normally only get as a mixture today. You don't get to choose the colors at all today, uh, but you could choose from 26 different colors and I suppose arrange them in, in uh, some design back in 1900. Sweet peas. Sweet peas were, um, were probably the third most popular annual at this time. And uh, if you've ever grown, grown sweet peas, you know that uh, they, they start off growing really nicely. And very often in midsummer, they, they get uh, a little bit brown and, and tend to die back. They really prefer cool weather. One of the tricks to growing good sweet peas is to dig a little trench about six inches deep and plant the seeds at the bottom of the trench. Then as the sprouts come up, gently fill the trench in. Don't, don't bury the seedlings but just backfill that trench as the seedlings grow taller so that the roots will wind up further down under the ground. Once the trench is all filled in, the roots are six inches deeper than they would be otherwise. And that stops them from uh, getting too dry and it also keeps the roots cool. You'll have much better success with sweet peas that way. Keep it well watered. They just like to be cool and they like to be uh, moist. They're, um, they're, they're suited for, uh, for England. That's where they grow really well. Uh, but we grew them by the truckload here in 1900. Sweet peas were incredibly popular and uh, I have grown them very successfully by using the trench method. You should try that. How do we know all this? How do we know so many things about nasturtiums and, and the kinds of plants that people grew? Well, uh, we learn a lot from looking at old diaries and old photographs. You've seen some of the photos that I have on hand and you'll see more as we go along. They're kind of black and white, so it's difficult to tell sometimes what's in the picture, but that's, uh, that's, that's part of the fun, I guess. Uh, another really good source of information are the seed catalogs. This is uh, Mackenzie's seed catalog from 1908. And if you recognize the name Mackenzie Seeds, it's the uh, currently biggest garden seed company in Canada still based in Brandon, Manitoba. Um, and back in 1908, over uh, 110 years ago, you could get just about any kind of plant. They had flowers, they had vegetables, but look what else they had. You could get palms, you could get potted ferns. They had all sorts of different kinds of roses and climbing vines because we had really good train service. Once they had put the train in from coast to coast, you could get just about anything by mail order on the train. And uh, the shipping was fairly affordable. So um, people really almost of any uh, uh, level of income had access to anything that you can think of today that you can order. Now, within reason, uh, how much do you think that this nice potted palm might cost? And I know it's difficult to see the, the, uh, the prices in this, but the, uh, a good size potted palm tree would cost about 75 cents from this company. And that might seem like a really good deal, 75 cents for a potted palm. But then consider that at this time, the average working man made about a dollar a day. So that palm would cost you three quarters of a day's pay. Um, that means you wouldn't see it in everybody's house. But if you had 75 cents to spend, you could order a palm tree and really just about anything else. Any flower that you can think of, any, uh, any plant species that you can think of, most of them had been found wherever they are native in the world 
whatever jungle they might have come from. And, um, and they had been domesticated and, and put into cultivation by this point. Here are some examples of some of those seed packets. These are the flower section now. All the same kinds of uh, species names that you would see in a, a seed catalog today. This doesn't show you the uh, assortment. Um, you won't see uh, 103 different uh, packages for asters. They would all just wind up being in the same asters package. And hopefully they write the variety name on the packet so you know which one it was. But certainly gardeners had a great assortment, even 100 years ago. And by mail order, you could, you could, uh, as I said, get any kind of seed that you could think of. The Mininet is a really nice one that many people don't know today. Look for it. It's a, uh, a, a flower that doesn't really look like very much. It's a background plant. It's mainly grown for its fragrance and it's a good, a good um, bee attracting plant. Uh, look, look it up, Mininet, M-I-G-N-O-N-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. And uh, you'll see that it isn't really anything to look at, but if you put it in with some other flowers, it adds a, a wonderful fragrance. Lots of nasturtiums. Remember, we had 26 different colors of nasturtiums just from one seed catalog. But I'd also like to draw your attention to the bottom left, the musk plant. Have you ever heard of that? This is what it looks like. It's a kind of mimulus. It was uh, called the mimulus muscatus, the uh, botanical name. And at its time, it was uh, one of the most popular window box plants. You could get mimulus muscatus plants, musk plants, from all over, from any nursery, from uh, even from uh, the Eaton's catalog. For those of us who remember the Eaton's company, they had a catalog uh, which was widely used and they only sold the most popular things. They were not a specialty company. So if they sold the musk plant in their catalog, it had to be very, very popular uh, for everyone all across Canada. And it was. You would put this musk plant in a window box or a flower pot, and they said that you would, would be able to smell the fragrance all the way from the road. It was so fragrant and so delightful. Everybody grew it for the fragrance. But then for some reason, around the mid 1920s, it started to lose its fragrance. It became a, a horticultural mystery. No one knew the, the reason. And you can read uh, at the time, um, biologists trying to debate the reason that the musk plant is losing its fragrance. It, it faded year after year and then disappeared. And, uh, and then it was an unscented plant after that. Um, still remains a mystery. No one knows why that happened but people stopped growing it and seed companies and nurseries stopped carrying it. And then the wild source of Mimulus muscatus, the musk plant, which is in Washington state somewhere, got paved over. They built a city on top of the place where the uh, musk plant was originally found and it no longer exists in the wild either. It is extinct. So this picture that you see is not actually the Mimulus muscatus. It's a plant called Mimulus luteus that looks just like it, but it was always unscented from the beginning. I've grown it just to show what the musk plant looked like, but uh, it is as unscented as the musk plant became. A horticultural mystery, perhaps it will never be solved. More nasturtiums. They loved their nasturtiums. And more nasturtiums and sweet peas. Well, here's a plant that you should know if you don't. It's called salpoglossus or velvet tongue. You can uh, find seeds uh, if, you, if you search for them. Uh, it's very difficult to find um, bedding plants. Uh, and the reason is that it only uh, blooms on, uh, on, on uh, tall plants here. It's a tall plant only blooms after it's grown tall, I should say. Uh, and so you won't find it in bloom in, uh, uh, in a nursery pack. Um, that makes it difficult to be sold because people don't know what it will look like. People like to see the, the flower in the nursery when they buy the seedlings. And so uh, uh, only dwarf uh, seedlings tend to be sold. This one is only available by seed. I, 
I absolutely encourage you to try it. Uh, it grows like a petunia. It's very much like a petunia. Um, and it is related to uh, petunias. Of course, you can sort of tell by the shape, but the colors are fantastic. They range from pink to uh, yellow. You see some yellows at the top of the picture on the left. Uh, there are blues and purples, and then most of them have all of those colors all combined in, in this uh, amazing way. Uh, it's a lovely plant to grow. So uh, look for it. Salphoglossus or velvet tongue. Peonies were very, very popular just as they are today. Um, many of the peonies that we find in, uh, in older gardens, say at uh, farmhouses today, are actually 100 years old. Peonies can live for a very, very long time. So people have collected very old samples of peonies from those old farmhouses and, uh, and, and perpetuate those varieties. So um, heritage peonies are quite easy to find. Many of the modern favorites are actually uh, varieties that are 100 or 150 years old. And they still smell and look just as good as they did back then. Uh, dahlias on the left and uh, bleeding heart on the right. We have uh, many different kinds of dahlias. There are some that are as tall as me, and there are some that are just uh, six inches tall that are used in, in bedding or containers. Uh, the older kinds tend to be tall. And in general, this is what you'll find, that the, the older varieties uh, of all plants tend to be taller because one of the things that we've done during the last hundred years is to breed shorter varieties for bedding purposes. If you want uh, another tall plant, Cosmos is one. Uh, the old Cosmos, the old fashioned um, standard kind of Cosmos is uh, four feet tall, chest height sometimes. Um, you can find shorter varieties of cosmos that only grow about a foot tall, but those are, are uh, much more modern introductions that have been made to be shorter. And this is a different kind of petunia than you might expect. These are petunias, but what, ha what happened um, during the 20th century is that we also bred petunias to be shorter. They started off as these long vines. We um, got petunias originally from South America, from the jungles. They actually are a vine that climbs up in the trees in the South American jungles as perennial vines. And uh, so when they were first introduced as cultivated uh, plants, they were kind of poorly behaved. They were given a reputation of being unmanageable and, and uh, only good for sort of along a fence where they would just have to climb and, and uh, uh, look after themselves a little bit. It's only during the last uh, century that people have bred shorter and shorter petunias so that they would fit nicely in bedding packs and so that they would make a, a nice uh, tidy bedding plant. And then remember what happened with uh, those window box petunias. Someone came out with long vine petunias that trail. So you can put them in a container and they, they make a vine and hang down. We thought those were new when they came out, but actually all they did was go back to the original petunia and get the old vining kind again. This is phlox. Phlox comes in a variety of colors, pink, purple, white. It's quite easy to grow. Uh, it uh, comes back year after year with very little care. There are some varieties of phlox that have a, a mildew problem. They get uh, a white powder on the leaves and Recently, there have been some um, improved varieties that uh, don't have that mildew problem. But in fact, there are heritage varieties that also don't have the mildew problem. And when they, uh, when they produced the mildew resistant uh, newer varieties, they actually went back to the old heritage genetics to get that uh, the gene that's resistant to the mildew. So it's, um, it's actually important to keep uh, older plants around, uh, especially flowers, because there aren't as many uh, varieties uh, of say flocks around as there once were, we need those as a breeding population so that we can keep on making uh, uh, new and improved varieties using the old genetics. Straw flowers, we grow lots of straw flowers. Um, uh, people uh, really like uh, to be able to take something with them and when we grow lots of straw flowers we're able to share. Uh, they grow several of these little um, uh, tight little pointed uh, blossoms every day. 
And if you cut them with a nice long stem and hang them upside down to dry, the, uh, the flower stays exactly the way you see it here. It stays the same shape and the same color, um, uh, even when it's fully dry. So you hang it upside down to dry so the stem stays straight. And then you can make a, um, a, an arrangement of these straw flowers uh, that lasts forever. It should last all winter and, and uh, even for several years. Houseplants are really important. Um, you'll, you'll see this in uh, old, old photographs like this of uh, uh, a porch with lots of houseplants out on the porch. The reason for this is, uh, first of all, we don't put the houseplants indoors as much as people would today because the windows on old houses are small and they, they don't have electric lights. So um, even in the middle of the summer, the house is quite dim. So that's not great for a houseplant. The houseplant is much happier being out on the porch in the first place. But just the same, we don't want to put the houseplants in the windowsill because that blocks the light for us and makes it even dimmer. So houseplants on the porch. And then what about the winter? Well, we can't put the houseplants on the windowsills in the winter either because the old fashioned windows were so bad, uh, they would ice up inside. So any houseplant on the windowsill would freeze at night. And remember the, the heat for the house is coming from a stove or a fireplace that's far away from the window. So um, house plants had to be the kind that would go dormant over the winter and just, just live in, a, uh, uh, in the middle of the house, but far away from light and be okay with that. So ten, ten, we tend to use um, tropical plants that are, are really jungle understory plants for house plants. It means that uh, they're from the, uh, the jungle uh, the, and they grow on the ground underneath all those trees. So they're always in the dark where they come from. They're used to being in the low light and that's why they do well in a, in a dim house. So given all this, how can you make your garden look old fashioned? How can you create that old fashioned look in your garden? And there are a few rules of thumb that I've, I've found out that can give you that, that feeling of a grandmother's garden. Um, first of all, I could say, make everything black and white because they didn't have color back then, but that's not true. Of course, they had, they had lots of color. If anything, they loved color more than I think we do. And we love color, right? But we have things like brightly colored plastic and brightly colored clothes and, and TV that has lots of color. Our eyes see lots of color these days. But a hundred years ago, we didn't have those things. And can you imagine when your clothes were just sort of plain colors and things that were uh, in nature are basically green and brown and the sky is blue. Well, flowers. Flowers were the most colorful thing that people saw. And that's why they loved them so much. That's why they wrote about them. They wrote poetry about flowers because they were, can you imagine not seeing the kinds of colors that we see every day today flowers would be the most beautiful thing. And that's what they were. That's why our, our friends here in the picture have a, a whole backyard full of flowers. I think they probably sell them. I think they probably cut these flowers and sell them. They're, they're amateur florists. And that was a thing that people did. Well, use color. Use color is my first, first message. So no black and white. Let's go to color pictures. Uh, tall is also an important thing. We have so many short little plants. And I said before that we had spent the 20th century making our plants shorter and shorter. So they fit in nice little tidy bedding plants. And more importantly, so that they bloom in the nursery. When people go in the spring and buy their bedding plants, they want to see what the flowers will look like. The only way that can be possible is if the, uh, the, the flowers bloom when, they're, when the plants are only six inches tall. Well, old fashioned plants are generally much taller. So all of your varieties of hollyhocks and dahlias here, they're all tall kinds. They didn't have any short kinds. We made those in, in the later 20th century. You see how a tall plant, these are celosia, these are an annual. They grow from a, a very tiny seed uh, in just a few months. Um, celosia, coxcomb, um, see how this tall look, it makes it sort of a human scale. Um, as opposed to just having uh, little short carpet bedding plants that are only as high as your ankle. That would, that would give a kind of a, 
uh, of a tidy, what's called a carpet bed kind of look. But these, these plants, these flowers are right up at your face level. They're personal, they're human sized. And that's what makes this feel like an old fashioned garden. It's the human size of the plants. So tall, tall plants, you'll, you'll uh, make that old fashioned look. Now you won't be able to find, like I said, tall varieties in bedding plants because they only sell bedding plants in, in, as little dwarf varieties so that you can see the flowers. And uh, these zinnias here, these grow about three, almost four feet tall. And then you don't see any flowers until July. So you have to wait for a while for the plants to grow up um, tall enough and then they have flowers way up at the top once they've grown that tall. If I can't get these as bedding plants, it means I have to grow them from seed. And that's something that I'm afraid you will have to do. If you want tall annuals, you are going to have to uh, find seeds. Um, seeds are often not difficult to grow. Uh, zinnia seeds are really easy. These are just a, it's a handful of uh, zinnia seeds that I took from those very same um, flowers that I showed you in, in the previous slide. The flowers turn into a brown seed head. And if you pick off the brown seed head, uh, the plant will grow more flowers. But let a few of them grow or, or mature all the way until the seed head is completely brown and dry. And inside you'll find these dark, black, firm seeds. Only when they're, when they're hard to the touch and firm and fully dry, are they ready to be picked from the plant? If you pick them kind of green or kind of soft, then they won't um, they won't grow and they won't store until the spring. You have to get them when they're dry, brown, and and hard to the touch. Um, but you only need a few because this one flower gave me about fifteen seeds. I'll generally take uh, some red. We'll go back to that that picture. I'll take uh, some from a red red plant, some from a pink plant, some from the white. Uh, make sure that I get an assortment of colors so that uh, I, I get the mixture that I like. Um, but once you have that mixture, you have your own seeds. And I haven't purchased zinnia seeds for years this way. You can do the same thing. Remember the island bed? Uh, we saw some island beds in that park. Uh, here's another example. This is actually a page out of the Mackenzie seed catalog. Uh, they're advertising their lawn seed, but they had a really nice illustration of an island bed. Tall canna lilies in the middle, again, tropical tall canna lilies. Uh, begonias around those, I think. Like I said, black and white photographs, it's kind of hard to figure out, but I think those are begonias. Again, a tropical plant makes a lush kind of tropical look. And around that, I think they're pansies uh, around that, which is a bit of a, an artist's license because I don't think canna lilies and pansies really bloom at the same time. But anyway, it's a picture. Um, this, this is a, a kind of a, an elegant style to have in a lawn, a, an island flower bed, different from um, a foundation planted bed. Uh, it creates a, a, a really formal kind of look. And that was something we saw a lot 100 years ago. One question people always have is how do you mow the grass around that thing? And here's a good trick. This person um, made an island bed on a mound of soil. So you see how the plants are up a little bit at the edge. They're not draping on the grass. You can get the lawnmower all around nice and easy. Um, so an island bed does not have to be an obstacle for the lawnmower. Think of your garden as a, an outdoor room. Okay, a big garden with big plants. It's a human scale. It's a sensory experience. Why not spend time there? It's not just for looking at. Um, a, a garden like this is um, it's meant to be walked through and visited and spent time in. And so that gives a, an old fashioned look to a garden. It gives an old fashioned feel to a garden. The reason for it is that people did use their gardens as another room of the house. Um, because like I said, um, the house was kind of dim. They didn't have big windows, didn't have electric lights. So why spend time inside the house when you can be out in the, in the sun where it's easy to see, easy to, re easy to read. A shaded place is nice, comfortable, um, bright and outdoors, pleasant because of the fragrance and the color of the flowers. So it's a good place to entertain friends. An outdoor room. 
And finally, one thing that we see in um, uh, old fashioned gardens is the vibrant colors. I mentioned before how much more important color must have been to people who didn't have as many sources of color as we have today. Well, they used just drastically contrasting combinations of colors. The color palette in old fashioned gardens seems to be uh, use as much contrast as possible. So instead of saying, let's, let's make a, uh, a sort of lavender pink palette of color, that's, that's more of a modern idea, or making a, a yellow and orange, not very contrasting um, palette of color, that's more of a modern idea. Uh, an old fashioned idea would be to take purple and orange and plop them together, take pink and, and, um, and blue and, and yellow together just like this. You have uh, this really brilliant contrast of, of uh, deep purple uh, in the larkspur and uh, orange in the calendula. And that combination of color, it just draws the eye, it, it's exciting, it's bright. And um, I, I think the reason why they liked that so much is that they didn't see that anywhere else. It, it certainly is much better than um, just seeing things that were plain, which was almost everything else. So uh, thank you so much for uh, our little tour of uh, Heritage Gardens. And um, I look forward to um, offering other talks like this through the museum. If you have any uh, interest in, um, in history of the uh, turn of the century, and if you're ever in the area of Kitchener, Ontario, then do pay us a visit at the Ken Sealing Waterloo Region Museum. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.